Breaking tonight, Senator Al Franken, embarrassed, ashamed, but refusing to step down. Evening, everyone. Welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton, and this is the home of positive populism. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Now, while many of us were celebrating the holiday, the never-ending reports of disgraceful behavior in decadent D.C. continued. And just today, two big names on the left made big news. First, embattled Senator Al Franken spoke with media outlets in his home state of Minnesota, his first formal interviews, since this picture of him groping a news anchor surfaced and since three more women accused him of groping them. Franken profusely apologized, said he had no recollection of the misdeeds, but did say, despite the allegations, he will be back at work in the morning. Have you talked about seriously resigning? Have you considered that? No, no. The Ethics Committee is looking into all this, and I will cooperate fully with it. Listen, I know I have a lot of work to do to regain the trust of people I've let down. Um, the people of Minnesota, my, my, my friends and supporters and my colleagues, and especially everyone who counts on me to be a champion and ally of, of women. There aren't any magic words I can say, but I hope that um, I, I can regain that trust. Oh, my God, a champion of women. Please spare us. Anyway, then there's House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, who gave a bizarre interview on Meet the Press this morning. She brushed aside questions about Franken, but did address sex harassment allegations against another colleague, Democratic Congressman John Conyers. You said there's now a zero tolerance. Yes. John Conyers. What does that mean for him right yeah, now? Let's say In or out. we are strengthened by due process. Mm -hmm. Just because someone is accused. You, and, and was it one accusation? Is it two? I think there has to be. John Conyers is an icon in our country. He has done a, gr a great deal to protect women, Violence Against Women Act. As John reviews his case, which he knows, which I don't, I believe he will Why do. Don't you? I believe that well, he. How will, is it that excuse you me? Don't. May I finish my sure, sentence? Sure. That he will do the right thing. Honestly, for weeks now, the Democrats have been indulging in their favorite activity, moral superiority and self-righteousness, as they condemn Republican Senate candidate Roy Moore. And then there you saw Nancy Pelosi, the great liberal champion for women, I guess as much of a champion as Al Franken, who of course passed an instant guilty verdict on Roy Moore. When challenged about sexual harassment and charges against a fellow Democrat, she witters on about the benefit of the doubt and leaving it to some BS bureaucratic process. After that rambling, shambling, car crash of an interview, defending a Democrat who used taxpayers' money to silence a victim of his own sexual assault, there's only one reasonable conclusion. Nancy Pelosi is either mentally unfit or morally unfit to do her job. By the way, as I've said before, the Republicans are no better. They're just as partisan and morally compromised as the Democrats. Just look at how they're behaving over Roy Moore. But of course, the low point in putting politics before principle was the Democrats' protection of Bill Clinton. Remember that in the 2016 campaign, Hillary Clinton promised to put her husband in charge of the economy if she won. Democrat politicians campaigning for her were campaigning to put an alleged rapist back in the White House. I guess they had in mind their own version of the saying attributed to FDR. Well, he may be a rapist, but at least he's our rapist. So, here's where we stand in American politics today. You've got the Washington Democrats who excuse rape and sexual assault, and the Washington Republicans who turn a blind eye to child molestation. Thanks a lot for your leadership. You know what? You all need to be kicked out, and I hope to God you are. In one of our earliest shows, one of our guests was Zach Exley, who started an organization called Brand New Congress to try and replace every existing member. When I spoke to him, I thought his idea was interesting, but a bit extreme. Now I think it's the only sensible option. We need a complete clear out. Primary the lot of them, vote them out, and start again with politicians who put the people first, not their own stupid political games. That's the next revolution we need. Tell me what you think. Tweet us at nextrevfnc. Tweet me at Steve Hilton X. And now let's see what our panel thinks. Joining me tonight, columnist at the Washington Times and member of the National Diversity Coalition for Trump Advisory Board, Madison Gisiotto. Also with us, Fox News political analyst Gianno Caldwell and former Bernie Sanders national staffer, Teslin Figaro. 
Teslin, come on. What's, I mean, the, I, I know it's ridiculous to sort of complain about politicians playing politics, but it's just so embarrassing when you have Nancy Pelosi there after, after week after week saying, we've got to believe the women, you've got to be, believe the accusers, but when it's a Democrat, it's, oh, no. Give him the benefit of the doubt. I and mean, what do you make of it all? I mean, we're really exposed. And I, you know, I said earlier today, I love it and I can't get more of it. I am so excited to see everything really being exposed. It's sad right. what we're going through, but I said, you know, it's best that everyone just braces themselves in bubble wrap because there's going to be a lot of stones thrown in glass houses. Everything that goes on on the Republican side, whether it's racism, whether it's sexism, whether it's sexual allegations, also goes on the Democrat side. Racism, yes. sexism, uh, sexual allegations. And so it's time the American people gets to pull the veil back. And what we been talking about the revolution with the Bernie Sanders movement to do an overtaking of the government to expose all politicians on both sides for the humans that they are and deal with it at hand. Democrats are hypocrites as well as Republicans are hypocrites. Nobody is above all. And what Republicans have done is they say, you want to play this game? Let's play this game. It's called opposition research. Every every predator you find on our side will find on your side. <laughs> so Democrats will have a whole lot of cleaning up that they'll need to do between now and 2018. So it's interesting because um, you've got the whole, um, you know, when people think about the populist movement and the revolution that, that you know, certainly happened around um, the presidential election here last year and with Brexit and so on, often it's economic issues mm -hmm. that people talk about. But actually, it's a sort of people being fed up with the whole system. It's not just economic stuff, is it? Right, no, no question about it. You know, me being a business owner, I've, I've put people to work. Two, three hundred employees that I put to work lost their business due to health care reform. That was one of my main concerns. But what my real problem was, working in Orlando, Central Florida, seeing politicians, the games that they play, the games that they particularly play even among people of color and African Americans mm -hmm. pretending to be. You know, even Malcolm X said, I would rather deal with the wolf than the wolf in the sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. So my problem has been pretending to be one thing and then on the back end, on the back end deal, doing something Else. And a lot of that has even been with Nancy Pelosi herself. So although I respect a lot of the policies on the left, which has benefited African Americans a great deal, I believe Republican policies have benefited African Americans a great deal as well when you talk about being able to, to be self-employed, to mm -hmm. economics being the only well, true we'll way get, out. We'll get to some of that mm -hmm. economics stuff later on. But Madison, I just want, I mean, you know, you're, as we uh, introduce you, you're clearly a Trump supporter. Don't you think that there's... Um, there's a hypocrisy on the right as well. It's not just Nancy Pelosi. You, you have you have that going on on the on the right as well over over Roy Moore, where the, the, on the right, so let's condemn the Democrat, but actually. Um, stick up for Roy Moore. You know, Steve, this is something I've been writing about for almost two years now, and that's the selective moral outrage that we're seeing across this country, not just in Congress, but among the American people. And what people are doing is judging, and we're seeing this with the sexual assault allegations now, judging people based off of political party versus judging them based off of the facts. Justice needs to be blind on these issues, mm -hmm. or else we're going to create a two-fold problem. And that problem is going to be, number one, women who have been sexually assaulted, we're going to minimize what they've been through and minimize the justice that they deserve. And number two, men who who are good men are going to have their lives ruined by false allegations. Yeah. So we need to let the criminal justice system do its job here, and we should never forget what's right just because of what party we politically align with. But John, what I mean, that point, it's a good point about yeah, the criminal yeah, yeah. justice system, yeah. but on the other hand, there's the real world timetable of an election about the political process. Sometimes it's just not feasible to say we're just going to let this play out through the uh, criminal justice route. You've got to make a political judgment about it. What's your judgment? Well, I mean, it, this kind of goes back to my home state. What happened in 2008 when there was a uh, venture capitalist running against a guy by the name of State Senator Barack Obama. There were sexual allegations that came out. Apparently, the guy was taking his wife or forcing his wife to go to a sex club. It came Wait, out. wait, about uh, against who? Uh, this was this the candidate that was running against uh, State Senator Obama for U.S. Senate. Right. Okay. And so th this happened, not 2008, I'm sorry, 2004. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, I, but, I didn't know what you said. I just wanted to make sure our audience was clear. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. About. So there was another race, was what I'm saying. It was a very yeah. similar allegation, and the Republican Party ended up replacing that candidate. He stepped aside. He did the honorable thing. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, State Senator Obama still won. I think especially when it comes to Ray Moore, Roy Moore, mm -hmm. this is a situation where allegations this deep, 
and so many folks come into the forefront, you must step aside. Uh, uh, President Trump said something that I agree with. We don't want a liberal Democrat having that seat. I agree with that. Therefore, he must step to the side and allow for a Republican to take his place. Obviously, it's too late for that now. He may actually pull it off. But definitely, we have to be consistent across all issues. And when it comes to something like sexual assault, sexual harassment, I agree with what you said. And of course, I agree with what you said as well. Uh, when it comes to those issues, it should yeah. be very consistent, nonpartisan. We I should totally be agree. About but you, I agree. I think we were all pretty much on the same page on the nonpartisan thing. But actually, there's an element of this. I think it's just an interesting philosophical difference between not even the parties, but the sort of philosophies, which is that typically, it seems to me, it is people on the left who tend to be more judgmental about the way people behave. We've certainly seen that as one of the drivers of the Trump movement, this sense of moral superiority. And we saw a real example of that this week with, with another liberal icon, Charlie Rose, right, who, who you know, we, we, we played a clip. I don't know if we got we got the clip just from a couple of weeks ago, just, just talking incredibly snooty terms about Trump supporters um, and, you know, taking this kind of self-righteous position. Let's just have a look at that. Um, but you see, what percentage do you think the far right, the far right, and I even me include white supremacists in that and nativists, what percentage of they are they of the Trump constituency. It's more than we thought. Oh, really? And I thought... More than, say, 10, 15 percent? Uh, I'm not going to put a number on it because I just don't know. Uh, but I, I can tell you that uh, I missed, like the night before the Charlottesville rally, like I missed the importance of that. So, Tess, I just want to come to you on this. We don't have too long, but just it seems to me that there's this guy, Charlie Rose, this liberal icon, you know, everyone in, you know, the kind of king of New York social circles. It turns out he's just treating women in a disgusting way, and he's going around lecturing people and sort of looking down his nose at Trump supporters. This is what people are sick of, right? Right. The guy he was interviewing said it was more than what he thought. It's actually more accusers with Charlie Rose than I thought as well. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, again, things are being exposed for what it is. I don't think the sexual misconduct is anything new, you know, to any woman that's at worked around any man in power. It's like what you're saying, being able to condemn others, whether it's been people on the right who have condemned moral decisions on the left or vice versa. You know, there's room to be cleaned up in anybody's house, mm. but to judge one party over the other as a blanket, I think is, you know, where we've gone wrong, clearly. Great. Well, um, we'll, 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 we'll get to some of the more economic aspects of this, as I said later on. Uh, let's leave it there for now. I like the fact that we all basically seem to be on the same page about this. Very good discussion. Thanks, all of you. Um, coming up, who will really benefit from the proposed tax reform? Workers or fat cap businesses? We'll break down the numbers after the break. And later, a shocking report on the illegal international ape trade and what can be done to help humans' closest living relatives. Don't go away. President Trump back in the White House tonight after the Thanksgiving holiday. He just tweeted that this is a big week coming up for tax cuts. The Republican tax bill, the president tweeted, they are, is getting better and better, and the end result will be great for all, he says. Indeed, the plan promises to raise middle-class wages by lowering the tax rate on the companies they work for. That, say GOP leaders, will save companies money to pay people more. The president says that a typical household will see a $4,000 raise if the plan goes through. But some labor groups are afraid companies won't invest tax savings in middle class wages, but instead pad the pockets of their shareholders. Jody Calamine, general counsel for the Communication Workers of America, joins us now. Jody, thank you very much for joining us on this holiday weekend. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, your union did something very interesting last week, and I'd love you to just explain what it was in terms of trying to take this, this GOP promise um, of the tax bill leading to higher wages and try and make it a bit tangible. Just tell us what you did. Well, uh, it was on Monday. Uh, we were a labor union, so what we do for a living is we negotiate wages for workers, increases in wages. And so when we heard the White House say that uh, by cutting the corporate tax rate uh, to 20 percent that workers would get uh, on average a four thousand dollar wage increase we reacted in a logical fashion we uh, sent a letter to uh, eight of our key employers and attached to that letter was a contract proposal under that contract proposal it says if the corporate tax rate is reduced to 20 percent every employee in our bargaining unit will receive a four thousand dollar 
wage increase. This is something entirely in the company's control. Um, the White House is saying and uh, congressional leaders are saying that if this tax rate were to take effect, this is what would happen. Uh, so we just want that promise in writing. We want it binding in a binding agreement. I, th I think it's just a very cr creative response to, and, and turning a usual kind of political promise into something that actually means something real for working people. Just tell us a couple of the, give us an example of the companies that you wrote to. Well, they're, they're household names, really. AT&T, Verizon, uh, General Electric, American Airlines, um, ABC, NBC, um, Frontier, CenturyLink. Those are the, uh, some of our key employers in the industries where we represent a lot of uh, workers, uh, telecommunications, airlines, uh, broadcast, uh, some manufacturing. So I think I can predict the answer to this question, but did you get any response? We have not yet. Um, uh, there's been no official response from any of these companies. We did uh, see a New York Times article about our letter. Uh, it appears in that article that at least one or other companies are calling this a stunt. Um, it is not a stunt. It is very serious. Uh, it is the White House that is promising all workers this $4,000 wage increase. All we're doing is asking for that promise to be put in writing and signed. It's not a stunt. So, so let's just um, take, take the big criticism that could be leveled at this. I'd like, like your response on it, which is, okay, you, we, we may agree that what you're talking about there is completely consistent with the political promise that, it's, that has been made, but when it comes to actually running a business, you can't just expect companies to make a sort of blanket pledge like that across the board and, and going into the future. What do you think about that point? Well, uh, that is, in fact, uh, not consistent with what the White House is telling the American people. According to the White House, if this corporate tax rate is reduced to 20 percent, everybody's getting a $4,000 boost in their income. Uh, so we live in the real world. We negotiate wages. We know that uh, you don't get anything without asking for it, without negotiating for it. Um, that's what we're attempting to do right now. In fact, this is something that, frankly, every worker in the United States could be doing right now. You don't necessarily have to have a union. You could be a non-union worker. Tomorrow morning, you could go into your boss's office with an agreement uh, waiting for his signature that says if the corporate tax rates reduce to 20 percent, you will raise my pay by $4,000. The White House says this is what will happen. I'm a little, we're frankly a little skeptical that that's how this will work. Mm -hmm. We've seen trickle down before. It doesn't exactly work that way at all. Uh, most of this money will end up in shareholders and executives' pockets. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we want them to put uh, their money where their mouth is. Well, I think it's a great way of, of focusing everyone's attention on that exact point. And on this show, we were always champion um, the working Americans, and this issue of, of, of stagnant wages is, is incredibly serious for millions of people, including our viewers. Jody, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. So. What, what do we think? There we are. <laughs> President Trump, early on, he sat down with union leaders. That's not the kind of thing you get from a typical Republican, but it was consistent with what he'd been saying about being different to the normal Republican candidate and actually representing working Americans who've been screwed by big business. So right. do you support I, this message? I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this. First of all, President Trump has a great relationship with the unions, so that, that's been incredible because I don't think that's something people expected from him when he was a candidate. Um, but when it go comes to this proposition that they've made, I mean, first of all, let's look at some of the companies specifically, American Airlines, AT&T, as customers of both. I think they need to talk to a lot of their employees and examine their performance before giving them a pay raise, specifically in customer service. But even when it, when it comes to the $4,000 wage increase, um, we, we didn't say, or President Trump and uh, the Republican Party did not say this is going to be $4,000 exactly for everyone. So if I'm someone who may get more than a $4,000 pay raise um, once my company starts making a lot more money when we have incentives to bring workers and factories and different people back to the United States, um, I'd really hate to be stuck in a contract that's going to give me a $4,000 raise when I could have an $8,000 raise. Um, on top of that, we don't even have a final tax plan yet. Um, I mean, right now we have to reconcile the differences. The yeah. Senate in individual brackets has seven. The House plan has four. These are things that need to be talked about. And of course, the state and local income tax deductions uh, is something that a lot of people are waiting to see what happens on. So this is not something that's super simple, and this is not something that I think we can even really discuss at, at, at that deep of a level yet um, on the corporate side because we don't have the plan finalized in front of us. Fair, you know, all, all fair points, but, you know, you know like, tr truthfully, I mean, they are doing something quite useful here, I think, which is exposing the, 
you know, the, the, these sort of political promises that are made and have been made for year after year after year by politicians left and right, how does it end up for an actual worker? Isn't that quite useful what they're doing? Well, first and foremost, I got a special my message for my clients, which is I'm calling you tomorrow about my four thousand dollars <laughs> for every contract. <laughs> you know, this is this was. It's, it's somewhat humorous to me that we kind of saw what we saw in this this uh, this letter went out. I think his members will probably praise him for his efforts and that. But the truth of the matter is, this tax plan, if it goes well, it does include a, a tax break for mm -hmm. these workers. So if you're a married couple making about fifty nine thousand, yeah, but sorry, million, they're not talking about the the reduction in the taxes. They're talking about the promise that the He's wages the will be increased. No, no. They're talking about the actual pay, the salary, the wages will be increased as well as the taxes cut. That's the bit that they're focused on. So we know that that's likely not going to happen in a way. So in why do they keep saying it? That's the point, Tessin, last word to you. Well, the problem is also with now, uh, some of those people who actually work in those unions and, and some of the people down at, at the bottom, those mid-level jobs, will actually believe that some strongly worded pen letter, you know, is going to make, you know, the private sector now change their whole uh, philosophy and pay scale. And that's the sad part, because now you have politicians who are making promises and also groups out there who are making it seem as if, oh, if we just send this letter, it's all going to happen. I get the idea of what they're doing to show that trickle-down economics does not work, but there are people who at the bottom and, and, and are, who are working that will actually believe, you know, that this could be a possibility. So I think there needs to be some voter education, like what she was saying. This cannot be dumbed down to just some one tweet, you know, or just some one campaign promise. We're actually going to have to spend the time, get into the nuts well, and bolts of it. needs to change. Okay, yeah. go on. So we keep in mind, though, President Trump did send out a tweet, right. but I haven't heard Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell make the same argument, and these are the ones that are directly crafting the legislation to see it get passed. So to, to make that argument as a whole for the Republican Party, I think would be dishonest. Well, okay, that's what they're saying then. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 I mean, no, I believe it, right? I've made that argument. I think low corporate taxes are good for working Americans. I've made that point regularly on this show. Coming up, in the wake of the deadly attack on an Egyptian mosque that left more than 300 dead, we take a look at the history of radical Islamist ideology and what can be done to stop it. Don't go away. The death toll in Friday's terrorist attack on an Egyptian mosque has risen to over 300, including 27 children. Militants attacked the crowded mosque during Friday prayers, setting off explosives and firing weapons at the worshippers in the deadliest Islamist extremist attack in Egypt's history. So you may be thinking, hang on a second, didn't we just beat ISIS? Well, yes, we've done an amazing job defeating them in their former physical base in the Middle East. But the problem is there's a deeper fight we need to win, and that's against the Islamist ideology. In the light of that, we wanted to bring you an interview from our very first show with former UK Justice Secretary Michael Gove. It's about the history of Islamist terror. Take a look. So, Michael, I just want to take a couple of steps back now from the immediate focus on, on the security response to this and actually um, look at the real origins of this threat, the nature and origins. This is something that you've studied and written about actually long before you had responsibility for these matters in government. Um, you wrote a book about this many years ago, Celsius 7-7. I just want you to explain to our viewers as simply as you can the real historical origin of this thing that we keep talking about, which is the Islamist ideology. They hear that phrase and, and they perhaps don't know exactly what it is and where it comes from. And in fact, some people might misinterpret that as meaning that we're just talking about Islam. What is this exactly. Islamist ideology? When did it start? Where did it come from? Absolutely, Steve. You are a uh 100% uh, right that we need to be clear that we're fighting an ideology, not a religion. There are some people who say that uh, this violence has absolutely nothing to do with Islam. That's a mistake. But there are other people who say that this violence is inherent in Islam. That is also a big error. Uh, Islamist ideology is to Islam as communism was to socialism, or as uh, fascism was to nationalism. It takes a, um, a, a noble ideal. Socialism is a noble ideal of sharing, nationalism a noble ideal of patriotism, and Islam is a noble faith that uh, sustains and inspires billions globally to acts of charity. But what Islamism does is that it turns that generosity into resentment. And Islamism says it's not enough simply that faith should be a private thing and that it should be a way of inspiring charity. 
Islamism says that it's a responsibility of Muslims to create an Islamic state with very, very strict Sharia law and to fight against those who are unbelievers in order to advance that goal. And the creation of an Islamic state, whether it's the caliphate that currently um, uh, straddles Syria and Iraq or something altogether more ambitious, is what drives Islamists. It's what drove Osama bin Laden, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and the guys who are responsible for the atrocities that we see. And it's, it's futile to think that they're driven by distaste for this or that president or this or that foreign policy. What they're driven by is a deep, dark hatred of the West, of liberalism, of Christianity and Judaism. And the way to defeat it is to be clear that the ideologues behind it People like Saeed Qutb and Hassan al-Banna, who were the Egyptians who helped form and develop the Muslim Brotherhood. And people like um, Maulana Maududi, a Pakistani thinker who set up a Jamaati group, which is in essence the Muslim Brotherhood in, in South Asia. We need to study their writings and counter the organizations that operate in their name. So the point that Michael was making there is that this goes back a long way. Um, not just a few years, not even a few decades, but about a hundred years. I just want to get the panel's reactions to this, not, not specifically the Egypt attack. Um, I'm afraid it's just the, the latest in a long line of shocking atrocities, uh, which we know all too well. But this, 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 the idea about defeating the ideology underlying this, how do we, how do we think about that? Do you think I, that we're taking it seriously enough? I, I think that it's not just a us situation. Mm -hmm. I think our Muslim brothers and sisters in these many communities that believe in their faith and they're not, it's not an ideology that's been manipulated in any way, they need to come to the table and also work with us as a coalition mm -hmm. to educate those around the world and around our country, uh, specifically around the world, because in, what was it, January, there was about 23,000 miles, square miles that ISIS occupied. Now there's about 9,000 mm -hmm. square miles that, that ISIS has occupied. So if we can work together legitimately and have a conversation and uh, educate people to let them know that there is a complete and total difference, then maybe we can get something done a little bit more than uh, what we've seen that's going on in the Middle East right now. What do you make of that? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I agree, but I just wonder <coughs> what that actually looks like. We, we, you know, we keep saying that, but it feels like um, we're not really making any headway in defeating the underlying idea here. Yeah, you know, I don't call myself a foreign policy expert, but what I will say is even in the Christian faith we talk about we battle against uh, principalities and not flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what that's saying, an ideology, a, a true mindset that has been engraved within a certain sector of people. Morgan Freeman has a good series out that he's doing now about mm -hmm. God and the different uh, you know, ideologies. And he actually talked about uh, groups, he focused on groups who were within you know, uh, those regions that actually helped to convert people back over from the ideology to right. really that's a really faith. interesting yeah, point. And, yeah, and it is going to take to come from within. You know, the West can't go tell this is how you need to be, and this is how, that just further promotes the ideology yes. that the West is trying to tell people control. how to, to control. Yeah. And so it really does take from within those communities to transform their own people, their own religion, to bring them back to, to focus on what mm -hmm. uh, the faith should have uh, should have been be you know should be. Madison, you know, I, I think we're making great strides in this fight against radical Islamic terrorism, but I don't think it's nearly enough. Uh, if we look at last year alone in 2016, 25,000 people across the world were killed mm -hmm. um, by terrorism. Ha over half of these people were killed by radical Islamic terrorists. Um, on top of that, 15,000 people were taken hostage or kidnapped. Uh, over two-thirds of them were taken hostage or kidnapped by radical Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. And this is not just against Christians anymore. Uh, they're attacking their own. When we look at the Egypt attacks specifically, yep. they attack Sufi Muslims, which they view as an idolatrous form of Islam. And so I think it's very concerning. We need to all come together and make sure that we stand up against this because too many lives are being taken and this is a problem that's been going on, like you said, for way too long. Yeah, I think that the, um, it's, it's the specifics that I worry about and there's so many different aspects to this. Um, we do, haven't got time to go into them all now, but I appreciate what, what you will say. I think that it's something that we just need to really um, keep coming back to because it, it, even though we've made great progress militarily, 
It's, and it's President Trump has been great that's when it right. comes to the military. That's right. That's not enough, as you and say. And, and that sounds good, saying stand up against it. But when you have a, a community of people that are willing to strap themselves up with bombs to die for what they believe in, I don't see yeah. any Americans willing to do that. Yeah. We're talking about something on a much deeper level that yeah. just can't be controlled military-wise. Yes, much but at least it that. feels to me like yeah. we, we, we kind of have a sense of the gravity of what we're up against now mm -hmm. and, and, and that our, our, our government is taking it seriously. That's, that's what it feels well, like to me. Well, our government has been taking it, well, not under President Obama, I shouldn't say that, but but sincerely, now we do see that. But at the same time, yes, as you said, as you said, in terms of the military coming in, in, involved in this, that's great. It reduces it. But we're not seeing folks of the Muslim faith really come to the table and say, look, let's join you in this well, fight. Let's some, go and educate. Yeah. Okay. I, sorry. We're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, coming up, there's a heartbreaking story about how apes around the globe fall victim to illegal trafficking rings and what we can do to help these beautiful creatures. That's coming up after the break. And now for a story that goes well beyond the Beltway and something I really wanted to bring you this Thanksgiving weekend. There is a billion dollar criminal enterprise going on right now and you've probably never heard of it. It's the illegal smuggling and selling of animals. There was an incredible report from the New York Times a while ago that took a deeper look at the issue and pointed out that the victims are some of the most endangered, intelligent and sensitive animals on earth. Joining me now from New Delhi is the man behind that shocking report, Jeffrey Gettleman, South Asia Bureau Chief for the New York Times and author of Love Africa. Jeffrey, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, but more importantly, for, for that amazing report. I read it a couple of weeks ago, and it literally brought tears to my eyes. There, there's so much in it, uh, I barely know where to start, so why don't I just hand it over to you. What do you think is the most important thing um, coming out of that, that report that you, uh, the wrote, you wrote in the Times a couple of weeks ago? Well, listen, I really appreciate being invited to talk about it. Um, I think it's really sad and disturbing what's happening with the ape trade. There are many animals around the world that are being smuggled, killed, poached, uh, traded illegally. And what, what bothered me was that this was happening to man's closest living relatives, apes. And that includes gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, bonobos. Um, and these animals are, are really smart really sensitive and what's happening is there's this giant global enterprise uh, connecting buyers in places like Armenia, Dubai, the United States, all over the world who want to get their hands on these baby apes either to use as pets or to keep in zoos or just for their own amusement and these animals live deep in the rainforest in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. And there's this whole pipeline of smugglers and poachers and businessmen and dealers that snatch these animals out of the forest, put them on ships, often drug them, beat them, abuse them, mm -hmm. and then sell them for thousands of dollars. And in the process of getting one baby chimpanzee, for example, often a whole entire family is shot to death. In the, in, the, in the forest because these animals are social, they're very protective. They're not just gonna hand over you know, a, a baby uh, to, to some, some alien force that comes into their habitat. And so often these poachers mm -hmm. will literally wipe out an entire family to get their hands on one infant. And why do they particularly want the infants? That was a big theme of your report. Yeah, I mean, this stuff is almost like too, too, too much to believe. So. To transport a live ape is very dangerous. Gorillas are incredibly strong. Chimpanzees are, are something like eight times as strong as the average human. And an adult ape is, is, is dangerous. 